Uh, I want to introduce Jamie Harris today. He's going to talk about the animal rights movement and our main challenges and how to overcome them. So quick introduction on him. Uh, he is the co-founder and researcher at the Animal Advocacy Careers, a new nonprofit helping advocates to maximize their positive impact for animals. Jamie is also a researcher at Sentience Institute, which is a think tank researching social and technological change. He has managed the local group Effective Animal Altruism London and volunteered at organizations including Faunalytics and the Good Food Institute. In his talk today, Jamie will show how the impact of the animal advocacy movement is limited by a number of factors. He will show possible ways to tackle these issues and will make some suggestions for further work that is needed. I'm really looking forward to your talk, Jamie, so stage is all yours. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for introducing me and uh, thanks to everybody at the International Animal Rights Conference for inviting me, really appreciate that. And thanks also to all of you guys who are listening and attending the talk, really appreciate your time. So I'm not going to introduce myself any more than that because I think hopefully uh, some of the work that the organisations I work for do will become a bit clearer over the course of the presentation. So I want to start by getting you guys to just pause for a second and imagine an ideal animal friendly society of the future. What are some of the main differences that you see between that society and the present society? Just take a few seconds to think about that. So you probably imagined change behaviors. So for example, people being more willing to eat vegan and people you know, having different diets and different actions in various ways. But you probably also imagined changed laws, for example, cruel treatment of animals being illegal. And so there are those sorts of institutional changes as well. And so the question is, how do we get there? How do we get to that idealized future society? Oh no, it's covered. <laughs> well, one thing we could do is we could focus on unchangeable things. So we could focus, for example, on some of the incoherent arguments coming from human biases and psychological effects. And so one example would be the, the often cited phrase in veganism of cognitive dissonance. A person holds various contradictory beliefs and ideas or values, and so they feel stress about that, and they try to adjust something in order to relieve that dissonance. And so that could mean they change their behavior, such as going vegan, to align with their compassion for animals. But frequently people just change their underlying beliefs to suit their behavior as well. And so they come out with these ridiculous arguments that don't really add up and make sense. So we could, we could think about that and say that's a massive challenge for the animal rights movement, and it is. Another example would be scope neglect or the identifiable victim effect, which are other psychological effects that have been studied, where pe which is where people struggle to comprehend the sheer scale of suffering involved in animal farming. Uh, they can only really imagine small numbers of individuals at any one time. But these things won't change soon. So thinking and focusing about those doesn't do us much good as a movement. Uh, Oops. So we could also lament that there aren't enough activists or enough money in the movement. But money doesn't grow on trees, and as we've just seen, sometimes people really just suck. So when we're thinking about how to overcome our challenges, we have to focus on what's tractable, areas we actually have control over and can make progress on. And so we're mostly thinking about this middle section here, movement actions, how we use the money and the time and resources that are available to us as a movement. And to some extent, this is probably pretty familiar territory to everybody listening. You might have had debates about topics like, uh, is confrontation an effective strategy to use to help animals? Uh, or which is more effective for helping animals producing, sorry, promoting reducitarianism or promoting veganism? Or do animal welfare campaigns make people complacent about the state of animal advocacy and animal rights and encourage humane washing of animal agriculture? Or do they generate more momentum for further change to help animals? And that's a key part of the debate on animal rights and animal welfare. The problem is that for these sorts of questions, people have different intuitions on them. And without reference to empirical evidence, research, hard facts, that sort of thing, it's hard to make much more progress because people just intuitions just clash against each other. 
luckily we can focus in on that challenge of not knowing what to do about some of these key strategic questions and we can make target targeted efforts to overcome it as a movement so as one example of a way of doing this census institute one of the organizations i'm a researcher at has listed what we call the foundational questions in effective animal advocacy and this includes topics like confrontation versus non-confrontation versus veganism and momentum versus complacency from welfare reforms and what we've done is we've listed the key arguments and evidence on either side of those questions uh, to try and sort of clarify that the state of the field at the moment and then we do targeted research to increase the evidence base for each of those questions and help us to make more informed strategic decisions as a movement so let me give you an example of of a problem that we've looked at let's simplify our diagram from before and ignore people for now so we just think about funding Imagine that you personally, as a listener, controlled all of the money in the animal advocacy movement to distribute between nonprofits and activists to help animals. How much money would you focus on trying to directly encourage individual change, such as dietary change and other forms of behavior change? And how much would you focus on big institutional changes? And I'm talking here about things like companies, governments, and wider social norms. How would you split the money between them? Well, animal charity evaluators have looked up the farmed animal nonprofits in the US that had annual budgets above about $200,000. And they found that individual interventions were just under half of total spending. Institutional and facilitative in uh, interventions, and that includes developing alternative foods to animal products, were just under one third of spending. Census Institute has looked at some of the historical evidence that might shed light on this question and what the movement should be focusing on. And historical social movement evidence pretty consistently comes out in favor of an update towards prioritizing institutional tactics and a focus on institutional outcomes. Where movements have been driven primarily by consumer facing advocacy, they seem to have only reached a tiny proportion of the population that they're targeting. So as one example that I'm looking at at the moment, this report isn't published yet, but it'll be coming out soon the fair trade movement only a tiny fraction of international trade is actually fair trade despite how widespread labeling is and awareness of labeling at least in some countries like the uk and lots of europe in the american anti-slavery movement there was the free produce movement and you may have watched uh, Rodex talk about this earlier today he uh, so the free produce movement had really limited success and was actually abandoned in favor of political approaches later on the free produce movement its goal was essentially to cut out all slave made goods so people it kind of comparably to veganism people tried to be kind of morally preferable and align their behaviors with their moral beliefs environmentalism is another example recycling has really impressive reach and it's really widespread well known etc but it only addresses a small proportion of environmental problems and a classic example of, of recent times of where this focus on individual behavior has just been blown out of proportion is plastic straws which make a tiny difference to the the wider environmental problem but is a huge focus of the movement some of the clearest examples of successes in some of the other movements we've looked at and, and some of those safe movements have been in various institutional tactics. So, for example, much of the successful activist action against genetically modified foods came in the form of relatively small campaigns focused directly on companies. Another example, the an anti-abortion advocacy in the United States seems to have failed to substantially change public opinion. And despite that, there has, been a, there has been increasing restrictions on abortion in the US, which is obviously the goal of the US anti-abortion movement, and they've succeeded in implementing those legislative restrictions. Another example, many European countries have banned the death penalty outright, and not just in Europe, many countries across the world, despite majority public support for the death penalty in those countries. And so we see that institutional change has been successful despite of uh, in individual preferences and individual behaviors. As another example of some targeted research that Sentence Institute has undertaken to address this question, we've done some surveying of the US public. We did this in 2017, and we've got an update from last year that we're publishing soon. Despite vegetarianism rates being below 5% in the US, there is widespread support for ra fairly radical institutional demands to help animals. So there's nearly 50% support, and actually over 50%, depend depending how you report the results in our most recent version, supported bans on factory farming or bans on slaughterhouses. 
And so there's much greater support for these institutional demands, despite people being unwilling to make individual behavioral change. And as a final example of some targeted research we've undertaken to address this question, we've con I conducted a literature review of behavior change interventions in other areas intended to improve people's health, like stopping smoking, changing diet for health reasons, increasing people's physical activity, that sort of thing. And most of the interventions in that area targeted at individuals or small groups tend to have effect sizes that are conventionally interpreted in social science as small or very small effect sizes. And incentives, price changes, bans on undesired behavior and other forms of policy change, i.e. mostly institutional tactics, seem to have larger effect sizes than most individual or small group interventions. So all in all, there's a very strong case for the movement redirecting some of its resources from individual change to tactics that focus on institutional change and with increasing its amount of whether that's redirecting some of its current resources uh, or adding more resources on the margin to focus on institutional tactics. So whether you work for an organization thinking about how to use its resources or you're an individual thinking about which sorts of activism to do, which organizations to work with, that sort of thing, the evidence for the, this question and the other questions on our foundational question summaries page uh, and the research there on our website can help you make decisions about how we should be using those, those movement actions. So I was kind of going into a bit of depth there as an example, but remember this is just one example of how we can focus on areas that we have, that we have control over, the movement actions, and try to firstly spot the challenges that the movement faces and then two, take targeted steps to actually overcome those challenges. And that's something I'm going to, a theme I'm going to keep going with in the rest of this talk. So I've been talking about Centers Institute's research, but we're not the only organization that's doing this sort of targeted research to understand how the movement can best take actions to have the best outcomes for animals. It's also, for example, the organization Faunalytics. And another example is Rethink Priorities. But there are several others. There's also different sorts to encourage this idea of a kind of like networking and discussions about movement actions and therefore how we can best influence the outcomes that we care about. So one example is the International Animal Rights Conference uh, that you're at at the moment. And there are also a bunch of online spaces to discuss and network about this. For example, the Facebook group that I administrate, Effective Animal Advocacy Discussion. And on there, there's also a link to a directory called the Effective Animal Advocacy Community Directory that I set up where you can reach out to people about career decisions, about movement strategy, about productivity, whatever, as long as they've expressed some interest in it and you have an overlap of interests. So those are other ways to think about um, movement actions and how we can best influence out outcomes. And I guess are targeted, those are sort of targeted efforts to address this problem that we face of not being sure which tactics are most effective. So far, I've been focusing on examples of how we can influence the outcomes that we desire, institutional change, individual change. But is there a way to influence those inputs that I mentioned as well, funding and people? Let me focus first of all on funding. There's certainly some evidence that organizations need money. For example, Animal Advocacy Careers, the organization I co-founded late last year, we ran a short survey last year with some different animal advocacy nonprofits. We asked them the question, what bottleneck do you identify most with in your organization? A bottleneck being something that's holding them back from having more impact for animals. Funding was by far the most common answer compared to some of the other options that we gave them. And this is, I would say, based on the evidence I've seen, this being one example, one of our main challenges in the animal rights movement. Oops. Earlier I commented that money doesn't grow on trees and that's true, but we're not completely powerless here to address funding and the, the funding gap that we have. Organizations can choose how much money to invest in fundraising, for example. Studies have shown that each $1 spent on fundraising, uh, typically charities are typically able to raise four to $10 in return for that. So there's a really strong return investment. And some organizations manage to fund use fundraising techniques that are, are far better than that. So the implication here is that potentially widespread use of effective fundraising tactics could increase the total amount of money that was available for animal advocacy nonprofits and therefore resources that were going towards helping animals. But individuals can also affect the amount of money that is available to the movement through their donation choices and their career choices. So let me give you an example. Imagine an investment banker who is motivated to help animals over the course of their career. And what they do is to, to do this more directly, they quit their job to take on a new role, cleaning out dog kennels. 
that banker pro could probably have done a lot more good if they'd stayed in their job and donated half of their salary to effective animal advocacy nonprofits. They might be able to help a few dogs each year or each week or whatever at a shelter, but their donations might have been able to help thousands or even millions of animals each year. And that's not an exaggeration. Some various research by some of the organizations I mentioned earlier suggests that those sorts of absurdly large numbers are within the realms of possibility for one individual. So you personally might not have the option to be a banker. Of course, most people don't. Um, but if you're faced with the option of having more free time to do volunteering and independent activism, or get that promotion in your current role that pays you a few thousand extra dollars a year or something like that, the promotion for a lot of people could well be the option that does most to help animals in that particular trade-off. It's not the right choice for everybody, but this idea of focusing on earning to give, earning as much money as you can over the course of your career, to donate as much of it as you can to effective animal advocacy nonprofits, can be a really impactful option for people who have good personal fit with that career path. So as well as increasing the amount of money that they, give, that they give to animal advocacy nonprofits, individuals can also make sure that their money is used effectively. This is mostly about picking which sorts of interventions and organizations you actually want to donate to. Some of the resources I've spoken about earlier in this presentation will help with that sort of decision making. For example, the foundational question summaries page that I listed from Centers Institute. But there's, there is also an organization dedicated specifically to this purpose called Animal Charity Evaluators. So I've talked there about funding. What about the people that make up our movement? And here I'm talking about a range of things within this broad category. What sorts of talent, expertise, and perspectives we have available to us? Um, uh, so for example, who is recruited into the movement and whether we manage to actually retain those people or not. I'm also thinking about how well we are able to make use of people's existing skills and also whether we're able to further develop people's skills and increase their, the impact they're able to have for animals. One aspect of this broad category of problems is a diversity, equity, and inclusion issue. This is from some research from the organization Open Philanthropy, which found that women were the majority of employees at farmed animal advocacy nonprofits, but they were a minority of leadership positions. So in other words, women were underrepresented in leadership, uh, whether they're not getting promoted enough or that sort of thing. And Animal Advocacy Careers has also found evidence that in both the nonprofit sector and in animal free food companies, that this same pattern occurs where women are underrepresented in leadership roles. So some examples of organizations taking targeted steps to address this particular problem facing the animal rights movement. There is the group Gender Equity in Animal Rights and they provide a mentorship program to support women to take on roles and leadership roles within the movement. There's also another organization called WANBAM, Women and Non-Binary Altruism Mentorship. Another aspect of this diversity, equity, and inclusion issue is racial inequity, which is probably more of a problem for the animal rights movement. Only about 10% of staff at farmed animal organizations surveyed by the group Encompass were people of color. And this, this group is based in the US. I think the survey was US focused, even though the percentage of people of color in the general US population is roughly four times that. So essentially the movement is just failing to reach out to and recruit people, people of color in sufficient numbers. Yeah, and that is despite rates of vegetarianism being consistent, fairly consistent across racial groups, and people of color may actually be even more opposed to uh, animal, animal farming on average than, than white people are. That's certainly what Centers Institute's surveys have suggested. So Encompass, as well as having identified this problem, well, others have pointed to it too, but as well as focusing on this problem, they have taken targeted steps to address this. So again, they're off offering a mentorship program, which is called their Global Majority Caucus for individuals of uh, people of color to, to gain support and mentorship to advance in their careers and help animals most effectively. They're also offering a diversity, equity, and inclusion institute, which is trainings for organizations, essentially, and there's one coming up in October. So if you're involved in a nonprofit and that seems potentially useful, that could be of interest. Another issue, apart from that diversity, equity, inclusion issue, is the geographical distribution of advocacy efforts in the animal rights movement. This is again some research from Open Philanthropy that shows that funding is heavily concentrated in the global north. So America, so North America that is, Europe and Oceania compared to South America, Asia, Africa. If you, um, 
if yeah, if you compare these figures of donations, donations and spending to the number of farmed animals in various parts of the world, then movements in the global north look about 10 times as well funded relative to the number of farmed animals as organizations and the movements in, in other parts of the world and the global south. And Animal Advocacy Careers has also conducted some interviews with advocates in various parts of the world and got them to basically estimate the number of people heavily engaged in farmed animal advocacy in their country. And their estimates suggest that the distribution of the number of advocates relative to the number of farmed animals is similarly imbalanced and kind of order of magnitude 10 times as, as much in, in various parts of the global north relative to various parts of the global south relative to the number of farmed animals in, in those countries. So this is potentially a massive problem that some parts of the world just underrepresented that they have an insufficient animal advocacy movement compared to the needs there. So one organization taking a targeted step to address this particular problem is the Open Wing Alliance, which is organized by staff at the Humane League. And they, are, they have affiliated organizations in every continent except Antarctica, of course. And they provide trainings to animal advocacy organizations and they also provide grants. There are other organizations providing this sort of training and support to advocacy organizations in other parts of the world, including Synergy Animal, which is based in Brazil, in, uh, and Anima International, which is based in Eastern Europe. And there are a bunch of other organizations that also provide funding to organizations in the global south and various parts of the world. So from, from top left going round, we've got Animal Charity Evaluators, Open Philanthropy, Effective Altruism Funds, the Pollination Project, and ProVeg International. And there may, of course, be others that I've missed and I'm not aware of. So another problem within this people category that I referred to earlier is we also have evidence that animal advocacy nonprofits lack employees with some types of expertise and skills. So we have some survey data on this. As I mentioned before, that survey I flashed up and animal advocacy careers, we're going to do some more thorough surveying of nonprofits on this sort of problem later in the year. This issue, there's some evidence to suggest it's comparably bad, at least, to the funding issue for nonprofits, this talent and expertise issue. We also did some research trying to work out which roles are harder to hire for through what I called a spot check of animal advocacy roles in, in 28 animal advocacy nonprofits. We looked at the current roles, all the staff, and compared that to the jobs they were hiring for to get a sense of which types of roles are hardest to hire for. And based on that research, the surveys, various other evidence, some key areas of where there is it's essentially insufficient expertise. This is a, a, a bottleneck in terms of particular types of talent. Uh, key areas that arose out of some of that evidence was management and leadership, fundraising, and politics, policy, and lobbying. So one thing that Animal Advocacy Careers we've started to do to address, to take targeted steps to address this problem, is supporting employees of nonprofits to get professional management and leadership training to upskill them so that they, you know, rather than having to recruit new people into the organization or the movement, they're able to address that problem essentially internally. Another step that we've taken is we've created resources online called what we call skills profiles. And this is essentially to give advice to people about whether they could enter and excel in these particular career paths. And so whether they, they have good fit with that type of role. We also offer one-to-one -one advising calls to discuss your career plans with you. And the idea is that we can help people find careers that are really good fit for them and that also take, uh, address important gaps in the movement. This is a, a flexible service, so it focuses the discussion entirely on, on your needs and your, the particular trade-offs you're facing in your career. It's completely free, so if you're interested in that, you could benefit from that. Please, please, please do go to our website and apply there. It should be easy enough to find if you go to animaladvocacycareers.org. So to sum up some of the stuff I've been talking about in this talk so far, we do face major challenges as the animal rights movement. Some examples that I've talked about, how to best translate the funding and the resources and the people that we have available to us into the outcomes that we care about, individual change, institutional change. We also have less funding than would be ideal. And this is not necessarily distributed in the ideal way because we have uncertainties about what the best tactics are to help animals the most. We also have fewer people involved in the movement and again, not necessarily distributed in the ideal way. Uh, and there's not enough of some types of talent as I was just mentioning. And additionally, in, within that category, there's some issue that the movement is not sufficiently inclusive of different groups. 
But despite there being those problems I've just mentioned, organizations can identify these challenges and take targeted steps to overcome them. And I've suggested some examples of, of actions that are already being taken to address those. And I think there's, I guess I haven't gone into detail on this, but I think this as a general principle, this idea of identifying the key bottlenecks that the movement is facing and taking targeted steps to overcome them. There's lots of opportunity for that. And there's lots more opportunities within each of these specific problems that could be taken that I haven't, that I haven't gone into any detail on. Uh, we could brainstorm potential solutions to any of these, any of these problems. Um, that targeted approach is not necessarily taken, but we can do it. And some organizations, as I've mentioned over this presentation are already doing that. It's already happening. But you might be thinking as well as an individual, what can I do to address these things? Maybe you, you don't work with an organization, uh, but you'd still like to address some of the main problems that the animal rights movement is facing. And that would be great. So hopefully some of the organizations I've mentioned over the course of this presentation might be of some use to you. Uh, you, you might be able to look up Animal Charity Evaluators and Census Institute for donation advice or advocacy advice. You might look up Encompass, WANBAM, or Gender Equity in Animal Rights for mentorship programs if you're from one of those underrepresented and undersupported demographic groups. You might look up the Effective Animal Advocacy Discussion Facebook group that I mentioned and the uh, Effective Animal Advocacy Community Directory on there to network and discuss these ideas. Uh, I've also mentioned Animal Advocacy Careers one-to-one -one advice calls. If you're already familiar with the space, uh, you've been thinking a bit about how you can contribute, uh, but you just need some direct assistance or bounce ideas or somebody to think about how you can most contribute. But if those all, none of those quite address your needs or, your, or for various reasons they don't seem quite appealing, if you're looking for one single place to go to get your head around how you can best contribute, uh, if, especially if you're new to planning for how you can help animals the most over the course of your career, or you're new to some of the movement-wide strategic issues that I've been discussing, my top recommendation is that you join our online course and workshop. There are nine sessions in the online course. They'll be released one per week. You'll complete the course alongside a cohort of like-minded individuals who are also thinking about how they can have, uh, as, help animals as much as possible over the course of their career. And it culminates in a workshop where you will create a co career plan and sort of plan out some next actions to take next steps on your journey and your career for helping animals as much as you can. And we've finished creating the content for this. It's not currently live, but it should be launched within the next week or two. There is a online, uh, like a expression of interest sign up form on our website currently. So if you go to the website, you'll be in sign up for that. You'll be emailed as soon as it comes out. But the other programs I mentioned, the skills profiles and the one-to-one -one advice, they're already live on our website. So yeah, that's my talk. Thanks again very much. Um, the website for the, there is animaladvocacycareers.org, sentenceinstitute.org uh, for, for the other organization I work for. Most of, the, most of these names I mentioned are really easily Googleable. You can just you know, type in the name and it'll come up. So yeah, thanks again for listening. Thanks very much to uh, International Animal Rights Conference for inviting me to speak. And yeah, I look forward to seeing if we've got any questions. Oops. You'd think I'd learn from it, but I'm always <laughs> unmuted. Well, uh, thank you so much for these insights. Actually, I think you know, Jamie, but I work for ProVeg and the challenges that you mentioned, they're really close to our heart as well. So um, I'm glad you brought them up here. And actually we have, um, we have a bunch or a few questions and one is two together. So it's a long text. I'm just gonna read it out loud and then we're gonna take it step by step. So thank you for your presentation. The pre presentation pointed out that women are well represented in animal rights organizations, but not in leadership, and suggested that training women to take on leadership roles could address this gap. Two questions. One, we're gonna tackle that one first. Globally, women are underrepresented in leadership. Did you find that female underrepresentation in leadership is more severe in the animal rights movement or it is comparable to global trends. If more severe, has your research explored why? Um, so my research is not focused on this problem per se. I think, no, I would say it is roughly in line with, with global trends. And so you could suggest from that, maybe that means it's a fairly intractable problem because this is a wider social issue. Um, I think there's a case for saying that the animal rights movement should be, you know, we, could, we do have control over this area. So we should be trying to be better than society more, more widely on that. And there are various interventions we can take. And for example, Census Institute did a literature review of efforts that have been made in the corporate sector to address equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion 
problems. And one of the things that came up as being one of the most promising tactics is mentorship. So uh, essentially for the reasons that you can connect people to resources and other contacts that can um, help them to, to advance in their career. So yeah, there, there, are, there are things that can be done. Um, but uh, yeah, as I say, it's not, uh, at least my impression is it's not noticeably more severe in the animal rights movement than elsewhere. Uh, the the um, the racial issue potentially more so presumably it just depends what your kind of like your reference class is what your comparison is uh, certainly certain uh, other social movements have struggled with that too and the, the corporate sector presumably I don't know a ton about it but I uh, I would imagine at least some social movements have far less of a problem so yeah it depends what you're comparing it to I guess. All right. So number two is globally training for underrepresented groups such as women has minimal impact unless the institutional biases and prejudices that preclude participation and leadership for certain groups such as women are addressed. Has your research explored institutional bias in animal rights organizations that could explain underrepresentation of women in leadership? And if so, what has your research found? Um, well, the, the short answer is no, my research at least hasn't focused on that. As I mentioned, you might be interested in looking up Centers Institutes, uh, it's on our blog, the, the, the review of, of, uh, of interventions that have been taken to address this. Um, let me just reread some of that question. Yeah, I, I mean, I wasn't advocating specifically for training for women um, to increase their, their representation in leadership. I, 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 I don't remember that being a, something that was particularly advocate for in that literature review, for example. But as I say, this is not exactly my area of expertise. It was just something I brought up. So I'd encourage you to read the literature review and have a look at uh, Encompass and Wham Bam and some of those different groups I mentioned to, to see their writings on it, if this is something of interest to you. But yeah, thanks for the, the detailed question. Really appreciate that. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next one. Uh, with the earning to give approach versus a more hands on approach, how can you address the risk that people lose contact with the topic and distance themselves in the long term from any engagement? Yeah, it's definitely a, a valid concern. I don't have like a, 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 a nice summary answer. But I think it does depend a lot on your personal, your personal fit with with particular career paths and your basically there are a bunch of factors that should influence career decisions and we've summarized these on our we have a page on our website called what we called it like glossary, glossary of terms or something like that and the, the ones i'll just list off some of the main ones personal fit in terms of how well suited you are to a particular role um there's comparative advantage which is how you compare to other people in the animal rights community uh there is career capital so like the skills credentials that you're going to gain from from working in those areas there's a bunch of these different considerations i think within that i would count that idea of like how vulnerable do you personally think you are to value drift and losing contact with the community as part of personal fit because you might say for instance i'm a person who i just really get really focused on what i'm doing at any one time and i really struggle to maintain the bigger picture if that's the case for you then that might make earnings to give less of a promising option for you i don't think there's a one-size-fits-all approach here and um, i do think it's a very promising option for a lot of people and it's something that people haven't often haven't considered i guess the other thing i'd say on that is i do think if that's a problem you identify you can take targeted efforts to address that so for instance you can just um, you can, one, one example is you can create a, you can try and find an accountability buddy, which is where you essentially have somebody who you sort of check in with every, you know, every month or six months, whatever it is you agree to do. And you basically just have a call and say, what is it that you're working on? How are you maintaining your interests? Whatever. There are a bunch of steps and it's going to depend a lot on the person. But um, as far as I know, there's no like research about which of these is best for maintaining interest, but you could try a, a lot, bunch of different things that could work well for you. The most obvious thing is just get really engaged with the effective animal advocacy community uh, and try and maintain, you know, like if your fringe groups are involved in there, if you're, you have lots of connections to colleagues and that sort of thing, then it's going to be a lot harder to sort of stray from the path, I think. So that's just, there's, I think there's a whole sort of class of potential actions you could take to address that particularly. But as I say, you know, diff there's lots of different, options in the in the animal rights movement and potential careers that you can take only to give is one of them and it's it's not for everybody but it's a great option for some people and something i think a lot of people have never considered so all right next one is a short one uh where can we sign up for the nine weeks course yeah thanks for that on the sort of practical note yeah it's not currently available uh, as i say it's going to be launched in the next week or two on the home page of our website there is it, it's sort of like there's, it says something like new to new to animal advocacy careers or something like that. And then there's a, a button underneath, which is just an expression of interest form. So for now, that's the best way to go. Actually, is my, uh, maybe I can just get the, the, the link. Is this, can everybody see what's going on on my screen? Is that, 
Uh, yeah, we can see that. Okay, that's fine. If you just go to Animal Advocacy Careers, and then, yeah, it's down here on the left-hand side. There you go. And then you just click on that. That's where it is. And I'll